good evening dr bhuneshwari ma'am shall we start ma'am yes ma'am okay ma'am a pleasant evening to all myself dr amsaveni working as assistant professor in the department of biotechnology kongunada arts and science college on the behalf of kongunada arts and science college and on my own behalf i feel happy to welcome you all for the fourth day and as well as the final day of this awareness series on intellectual property rights innovation and entrepreneurship jointly organized by mhrd's institutional innovation council ipr cell and department of biotechnology kongunada arts and science college between 24th july to 27th july 2020 with this uh, may i now invite dr v bhuneshwari ma'am associate professor and head uge department of biotechnology convener iic and convener of this program for the welcome address ma'am please thank you ma'am good evening to all first of all i dedicate my welcome in absentia to our beloved president dr m r chami sir and our guiding star secretary and director dr c a wasiki ma'am for their motivation to organize this webinar i welcome Uh, our sincere principal dr m lakshmana swami sir enthusiastic chief executive officer and leader dr v chinu swami sir dean r and d dr s paul swami sir most supporting dean academics from hod pg department of biotechnology dr s r madan changar sir and dr p sujata ma'am president iac for their constant support and immense help rendered in all our endeavors i cordially welcome our guest of honor dr ramesh sivan pillai research scientist remote sensing scientist university of wyoming usa who readily accepted our invi invitation in spite of his busy schedule for this webinar in a short notice i welcome you sir i kindly welcome all the participants for their interest for this webinar i warmly welcome the organizing secretaries dr r amsaveni ma'am dr g anbar si ma'am assistant professors in biotechnology and the session coordinators past um, participants from our institute and different institutions once again i welcome you all now i call upon session coordinator dr b vishnupriya ma'am assistant professor in biotechnology to introduce our chief guest ma'am please thank you ma'am good evening it is my immense pleasure to propose chief guest introduction on this session Dr Ramesh Sivan Pillai is a remote sensing scientist with the Wyoming Ge Geographic Information Science Center at University of Wyoming where he teaches remote sensing courses and directs the Wyoming View program at University of Wyoming. He earned his BSc physics from BSc PSG College of Arts and Science, MSc environmental studies from Cochin University of Science and Technology, MPhil environmental sciences from Bharatiya University. MS Environmental Sciences and Policy from University University of Wisconsin Green Bay and PhD Forestry from Texas University for more than 25 years he has worked on digital processing of remotely sensed data for applications in forestry rangeland agriculture water bodies disaster assessment and land cover or land use studies He has worked with several national and international agencies and academic institutions in India, United States, Mexico, Mali, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Russia, Kenya, and Australia. He served on the board of directors of America View and American Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing chapter. He has published a research article in national and international reputed journals. His total citations is about five twenty five. His H index and I ten index is thirteen and sixteen respectively. We are very fortunate here, such an eminent resource person with us, to share his views on the topic on publishing innovative research in reputed journals. Thank you, sir. Thank you for this opportunity given to me. Thank you, ma'am. thank you uh, dr bhuneshwari ma'am for the warm welcome and vishnupriya ma'am for introducing our resource person thank you uh, and thank you, now i uh, now i request dr ramesh sir scientist from university of wyoming usa to deliver his talk on the topic publishing innovative research in reputed journals sir please it's over to you sir okay thank you for uh, 
having me. I am, this is the first time I'm going to present in Google Meet because we use a different uh, tool to do online teaching. So we will try to start this. Okay. So can everyone see this PowerPoint? Yes, sir. Okay. So that's a good start. Uh, good. So good evening, everyone. Uh, it's 5.30 in the morning here. And so we will get started. And uh, so I know everybody has a lot of questions. So I will keep my um, slides to highlight the important topics. And then we can have time for questions at the end. So today we will talk about why we are worried about publishing and where and how to start. And then this is an important aspect that's coming up, like how to get a unique ID where our names alone are not sufficient. And finally, how do we select suitable or reputed journals for publishing our work? And if you have any questions, please feel free to type in the chat window. And I'm sure one of the coordinators will be taking that uh, or putting it in one place so we can answer as many of them as possible. So let's start with this basic question. Why do we publish? I understand most of the people in the audience are students. So what most students are focused on, even in the US, is preparing for tests and exams. Okay, that's the goal. So they think getting a good grade is the goal of an education. So what we do, or what students do, is they spend a lot of time to assimilate new information as they go through the semester. So from week one, we as instructors treat them that they don't know anything. And then as weeks go by, we are giving them new information which the student is receiving everything. And then what happens is that once the exam is done, students tend to forget it. So there are a lot of studies that have been done before where they've shown three months after the final exam, students retain only 50% of what they learn. And a year later, it's less than 5%, you know, unless you are able to use that information on a repeated basis. So at the end, we produce students who have very good grades, but they also are struggling to apply all that information they gained to address real world problems. So this is what happens in most US institutions. But the current world where we live in, it has become highly competitive, okay? For every job opportunity, there are lots and lots of qualified applicants. So whether it is a company or a government agency, non-profit, NGOs or academic institutions, everybody tells it's very difficult to sort through the applications to select whom we want. The competition is so intense now. So the challenge is, how do you stand out in this crowd? So when you send your materials, application materials, how do you stand out and say, here is someone we need to talk to or call for an interview? Or in other words, how do you market yourself to potential employers? So the advice we give to our students is you have to go beyond textbooks and lecture notes. Okay? Memorizing and reproducing in exams, which used to be the norm about 20, 30 years ago, doesn't work anymore. We need to go beyond getting a good grade and marks in India. If I don't know whether you use a grading system or marks, you know, whichever one you use. So 
getting like 95% or A plus or 3.9 out of 4, that alone is not sufficient, even though it is important. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you should not focus on that one. You should get good grades, but that alone is not sufficient. You must learn how to solve real world problems in your field. Okay? So we take what we learn from our textbooks and what the, our professors uh, lecture in our classroom, and then try to reflect on that and also we need to gain some, what we call like outside class experience, where we go out to the field or conduct research, attend professional meetings. So we could see how people are using these concepts to solve real world problems. And a few other things as you are spending time in your college career, you need to focus on analytical skills which is data collection and how to process the data you collected and interpret it. And the most important thing that needs to be stressed is how do you communicate yourself, whether you write it or you are giving an oral presentation. This communication skill is something that employers are looking at very keenly. How can you condense information and present it to a wider audience. So I just looked at, you know, I'm, I'm always curious to see what comes out of universities in India. So I always look at a few newspapers and here are some examples where, you know, <clears throat> there are many from IITs, of course, but there's one from NIT, but I didn't have room. There are a lot more and I didn't have room for everything. It's good to see that students are involved in their research activity right at their undergraduate level. So what is the benefit of doing this? We get a better and deeper understanding of what we learned in the class. Some will focus on a couple of them. So if you look at this study, and if you have time, you can read it in the newspaper. <clears throat> this team developed an efficient way to remove heavy metals from water. And the students who are involved in this project, they, I'm, I'm pretty sure they learned about the properties of various heavy metals. That means they did, just didn't stop at the lecture hall, but they had to go back and then they had to review all those materials. They understood a lot more about absorption. What are some similarities and differences between the heavy metals they looked at and at the end, they had a very good understanding of water chemistry. So by doing this research, you can go beyond what you gained from textbook or listening to a professor talk about it. And another added benefit is there is a very good chance that you will remember these concepts for a longer time. You remember earlier I mentioned that three or six months later, you forget half of it. Then a year later, you remember less than 5%. Studies have shown that students who are actively involved in research, they get to retain that learning for a much longer time. If we look at this other example that came from NIT, these students learned about composition of waste from different fruits a much deeper understanding of bacteria and how the fermentation process works. So it's not just drawing some figures and writing down some equations, but they get to actually see how those equations and drawings turn out to produce this result. So they played with how much the yield will be of ethanol if you adjust various parameters. So now next batch of students can look at this work and they say, what if, if we say change the fruit or we use a different type of bacteria, what will happen? Can we get the same result or will this be different? So the more and more questions we ask, our learning increases or what we call it as deep learning. So it's not that superficial learning 
we just do for the sake of doing well in an exam, but this helps us to really understand what these concepts are, whatever may be your background, chemistry or biology or biochemistry, we want to really go down in detail to have a full understanding. So what's the other benefits? You know, as a teacher, I can tell you that I learned a lot from my students and every year I continue to learn because we do this research in our classes. So the students will work in a new area or they use new type of data or they process things differently. And there's always something we learn, which we didn't know before. And the next part of that is at the end, doing a successful research results in creation of new information or knowledge that we are ready to share with others. So as more and more students and faculty are involved in research, what you will see the reputation of the student over the faculty that's involved in this research process the department where they come from, the college and the university, everyone's reputation increases. So I just pulled the goals of your college. And if you look at those six goals, all the things I described so far connects with these three or the last three goals that are listed. So what your college wants you as students to do is to keep pace with the knowledge era, right? Okay? And enhancing the mindset towards research and creation of new knowledge. And at the end, you know, when you go out in the real world looking for a job, you have these unique skills that employers are going to look for. So I hope through this, I was able to convince everyone why we need to do research, right? Or the purpose of doing research, especially in an academic environment. Next, we will look into the process of doing research. So where do we start or how do we get started? So in any research, it's the idea, okay? So that's what we are always looking for. They call it as creative minds and many names, but basically it comes down to who has new ideas. And those are the people who are going to be successful in this age of innovation. Now, the ideas we come up with along with the solutions can be groundbreaking completely change the field, or it can be innovative. Sometimes it's just incremental, where we say you're just increasing the efficiency of some products, what we call like a marginal improvement to an already existing process. And there are research where people reconfirm something that we already know, but in a new setting or a new subject. Again, these are general guidelines and it varies by disciplines and subject areas. So do not take this as the final one. Please consult with your research mentor because what is groundbreaking in one field may not be innovative in another field. You know. So how do we generate these new ideas? We go back to what has been published before and read as many papers as we can. Because when we read them, we get some new ideas. We will see a trend where people are doing the work in a certain way. So then we can start thinking, what if I change that one particular parameter? Or what will happen if I use this compound instead of another compound? So these questions or ideas will not come to us unless we read the existing 
literature. So here I just put in an example. Let's say somebody says it takes 20 hours for the reaction to complete. So we could say we conducted this in normal pressure. So what happens if I increase the pressure? Will it reduce the time needed to complete the reaction? Not that it's going to work, but this is how we say new ideas keep generating. The more we read, new ideas will start coming. So we, at the end, we must have a good understanding of the topic, whatever that topic might be, whether you are working in finding new medicines or you are coming up with a new way to generate a product, we need to know how it is done presently or what we call as the current knowledge or status of that topic. So doctoral and postdoctoral scholars they have to review this in detail. And that's how they come to their own understanding of, huh, this is how things are done. But I understand many of you are undergraduate and master's students, and you may not have the time to do such an extensive literature review. And at this time you know, of your career, you rely on your teachers or research guides, usually postdocs and postdoctoral scholars in your department for guidance. So that's one way we motivate undergraduate students in our university. As faculty, we don't ask them to go and read several papers. We give an overview of what has been done, and then we identify here are a few areas that we need to look at, and the student will continue with that work. So one piece of advice is, I know everybody wants to work on a groundbreaking research idea, but please don't wait for it. You know, get started as early as possible. You need to collaborate with students and faculty members in other departments. Because whenever we get these new ideas, we are quickly going to realize that it's not specific to one discipline. So if you are in biochemistry, you might find out you may have to reach out to somebody in biology or botany, zoology, or chemistry, mathematics, because we need to draw expertise from people in different areas in order to solve problems. And that's why we call it as interdisciplinary and sometimes multidisciplinary. So it's no longer the olden days of doing research where we focused within our own discipline. We need researchers with different academic background who can bring in like new ideas or they can take our ideas and they can refine it for us. At this stage, you know, two important things, again, I will re-emphasize are statistics and communication skills. So I know statistics, I'm not sure how detailed we learn in all these classes or in different degree programs, but here in most universities in the US, that's emphasized, you know, those who are going into sciences, whether it's social sciences, physical sciences, biological sciences, they have to take several statistics courses because you need to, to analyze data with statistical rigor. And we do have units on our campus that will help us to polish what we write. So we can go to, they are called like writing centers where we can take a draft of what we wrote and we can work with them to refine how can we express the same things crisp in the sense like short and sweet. So, <clears throat> so if you have friends who are in statistics and English, you know, talk to them and uh, share what you write or ask them about, I'm planning to do this study, what type of statistical analysis are needed. So <clears throat> every new idea 
that we have has to be tested. And depending on the field, where it can be observations or you can do it as experiments. And in certain fields like mathematics and physics, they do theoretical studies. But there is a whole set of steps that we need to do, starting from objectives, hypotheses, and designing an experiment or how you collect data. But I'm not going to go over all those because just a few days ago, Professor Kannan from Kongunado gave a talk on these topics. I encourage you to listen to his video if you have not attended it in person. So now that we understood why research is important and how we can get started, and I'm sure encouraging you once again to listen to Professor Kannan's talk. Now, this is something that's going to be an issue which is common, which I will talk about, where our names alone are not sufficient. We need to have something else. So there are so many common names. Okay? So I'm just looking at the chat window right now. I see you know, there are many uh, names, some of which are very common and some of them are not. So what we are able to see is that once we publish and we do a search, we find way too many papers than what we published. And my name is very common, by the way. And in the US, and I know sometimes in India, uh, people change their name after they get married. Or you could be in one institution now, and then later you will move to another institution. So I just made up an example. Let's say somebody by name Radha, it's a very common name was a student at Kongunadu and published a paper and later changed her name after getting married. Currently is a PhD scholar in Anna University and has published two papers. And once she gets her PhD, she's going to be a faculty, let's say in another institution. So how can she claim credit for all the papers she has published? So there are many databases that are existing where you could go and register yourself and claim a unique ID. And that ID you can include in all your publication. So that way, I'm just seeing somebody by name, uh, Murugeshan Ganeshan from Telangana. She could be in one institution this year in five years, you might be in a different institution, but you can keep track of all your publication. And the most commonly used one is ORCID, or Open Researcher and Contributor ID. Then there are many of them, but one good thing is they all talk to each other. But I encourage each and every one of you to go to this website, orcid.org and you can register and claim a unique ID before you start publishing. Because what you are seeing nowadays is that here are some examples where next to an author's name, you see those green small circles, those are all their ARC IDs. So in this case, this Achut Parajuli, Maybe it's in one institution this year, but might be in a different institution a few years later. But as long as we use this ARC ID, we can keep track of all the papers we publish. So if you have not published any papers so far, please do that as the first step. I'll go back and show you the same website if you have not written down, it is orcid.org.
Next is this question of selecting the journals where we want to publish our findings. And this is the most tricky part for any experienced scientist as well. So I don't want to say that, yes, we all know exactly where to publish. Yes, in some disciplines, it might be easy, but for most people who work in interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary areas, it's always a struggle to decide where to publish. So my recommendation is that as undergraduate students or even master's students who are planning to, or who are thinking about publishing their work, I will encourage you to submit your manuscripts to a good peer reviewed journals. So for those who have published already, you know what I'm going to say, but for the benefit of those who have not published, so the peer review process happens in this following steps. As an author, you submit a manuscript to a journal and the editor will invite two or more experts to evaluate that manuscript. And those experts will review the manuscript and they will make a recommendation to the editor saying that, yes, this work is worth publishing or not. But most importantly, they will give comments and suggestions that needs to be incorporated before it is published. And the editor will decide to accept or reject that paper with or without revision. It's not a perfect method, but it works well. Because I want to make sure that this is not a fair process. People who have published, they will probably tell us, here are the problems we are facing. Because sometimes the experts are really not giving useful suggestion, you know, there's a lot of frustration. You ask anybody who published it. But as of now, we have not found a very good alternative yet. But having said that, uh, European Geospatial Union, or EGU, they follow a process called open review, where they post your manuscript on a separate website where anybody could come in and comment on your work. Not just two or three experts, it's just open for anyone. And everybody will sign their name and they will say, yep, I read this manuscript, this is what I liked, and here are some things that I didn't like, or here is the flaw, or this needs to be addressed, something. And usually the editors leave it in that open flat platform for about three months, and then they look at all the comments they got, and probably they invite one or two experts to go over all those comments, and then they make a decision. But majority of the journals follow the process that I outlined earlier. So selecting a journal is also, again, it poses difficulties from different perspectives. Okay, so if you have a groundbreaking research, you know, that is going to completely transform your field, probably we are going to aim for highly reputed journals. I'm going to come back and introduce that term impact later. But these journals are looking for this groundbreaking research, science, nature, you know, those are certain journals that I can mention right away but they are looking for these studies that have literally taken a subject to a new area. Then you have innovative, incremental, and those who are reconfirming what we already know, they all fall into different tiers. Okay. So as a researcher, where do I find out What are the rankings of these journals or the journal that I'm thinking is high impact or you know, an average or low impact? 
So this is where these databases that are used for indexing these journals come into play. So the first and foremost is what is called as Web of Science. That is considered as the golden standard where one can go and look at the journals that are indexed in that database. Then depending on the discipline, there is PubMed, Scopus, and I understand in India, UGC has made its own list of journals that one can publish. But we have these databases specific for certain disciplines, such as chemical index, engineering index, and as the name indicates, you know what type of journals you could find. So once again, based on the work that you are doing, you need to consult one or more of these indices to decide where you want to publish your work. And most importantly, journals are also ranked. And journal citation report, which I will show some interface in the next few slides, is considered the golden standard. So my department encourages all the faculty to publish their work in journals that are ranked by JCR, or Journal Citation Report. So if you look at any website, they will mention that here is the impact factor of our journal as reported by JCR. But unfortunately, there are so many bad apples, you know, where these journals are not interested in doing peer review or disseminating your information. They are just interested in collecting money from you. So they use a lot of tricks to convince you that they have impact factor. So here is an example where I found one where it says journal computed impact factor. And they put that journal computed in a very, very small font that it's very hard to see, whereas the impact factor is put in a very big font. So people will think that, yes, there is an impact factor for this journal, but unfortunately, it's not. So you have to do some research to see whether that journal has received an impact factor and is listed in JCR. And I'll tell you why this is so important. So if you go to their website, this is what it might look like depending on whether your institution subscribes to the service or not. So if I browse by category, and since this talk is organized by biochemistry and biotechnology, I just looked at that list and you could see that biochemistry and molecular biology, there are 297 journals that are listed in this database. That's like a lot of journals. So if we look at those 297, here are the top 10 and you could see cell is number one, followed by Nature Medicine, Annual Review of Biochemistry, and so on. These are the top 10 journals. And here are the bottom eight. So here is the 297th journal, Environmental Pollutants and Bioavailability. I think they just got added recently. So what is this impact factor? And why is this important? So the reason why cell is ranked number one is because it has an impact factor of 38.637. So what this means is that every paper that is published in this journal has been cited approximately 38 times or 39 times. 
In other words, if you publish your work there, there is a good chance that it's going to be cited. Or another way of looking at it is people who are doing groundbreaking or innovative research are those who are publishing in that journal so that other people are reading it and citing it. Whereas if we go to the bottom ones, you could see this 296th journal, Molecular Genetics, Microbiology and Virology, has an impact factor of 0.25, which means that for every four papers they publish, they get one citation, which means that, yeah, all the papers that are published in that journal are not cited that often. And again, this is not a perfect index. You can publish your work in a journal that has very low impact factor, and you, your work may be well cited. And I'm sure there are papers in cell that don't have a lot of citations. You know, the extremes are possible, but in general, this is what we use to select journals in your field. So why do we keep saying that we want to include our <clears throat> publications or we want to publish in these journals that are listed in here? The major advantage you can have is you can track your citations over time because that's what is becoming the next important thing. It's okay to publish, but did your work create interest in your community. That's the measure people are interesting to look at right now. So the more citations for our paper means other people are recognizing our work. And as we are cited more and more, the reputation of the author will go up. And that's measured by this index called H-index. And I know there are multiple ways of getting the H-index. Google Scholar calculates the H-index, which is always a little bit higher than what the Web of Science calculates. So what is H-index? H-index is a measure of how many papers are cited for that many times or to explain it, you know, I'll use this example. So if somebody has an H index of one, that means one of their paper has been published, has been cited once. If they have a H index of two, that means two of their papers have been cited twice each. Three means you have three different papers that each one of them has been cited three times each. So as you see that logic as that number is higher and higher, that means you have more and more papers that are published, are cited that many times. So when somebody is approaching retirement, they are looking at now, what is your H index? I'm sure in many universities in the US, that's one way people cite during retirement parties that his research contribution was so good. And then they will say what the H index of all the papers that particular author has published. So we want to do research which is meaningful and which is also interesting for others and they say, yeah, that's a really good research. Now I want to build on top of what they have done already. Okay. So in summary, to go back and recap all the things I talked about, in order to conduct successful research, one needs to have a deeper understanding, you know, will result in deeper understanding of the subject. Please partner with others or experts outside your discipline. If you are an undergraduate student, you know, 
start as soon as possible. This is the right time. Don't wait. Okay. And at the same time, you know, don't wait for groundbreaking ideas. You can start with very simple research. Go back and talk to your faculty members. And if you have postdoctoral fellows or PhD scholars in your department, consult them, ask them, you know. Go for like tea, coffee, have a chat in an informal setting to understand, learn what they are doing. What is their research? What type of questions are they trying to answer? And then get started. And once you have completed a work, I would say please get an ARC ID and then submit them to journals that are indexed in Web of Science so you can track your citations and you can see your h-index grow over time. Now, Google Scholar also uses uh, the same concept, but they allow a lot more journals and other outlets. So that's why the h-index will be always higher in Google compared to Web of Science. So Web of Science is a lot more stringent. So I wish you all the very best for a successful career in science. And once we do these publications, what it tells your future employer is that here is a person who knows how to solve a problem. So they know where to start, how to design, or how to go about getting a good set of data, how to analyze it, and how to communicate it, which is the most important thing we need for the next generation. So good luck, and I will take any questions if you have. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the uh, excellent presentation. It was highly informative, sir. Thank you, sir. And, yeah, okay, um, no problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So participants, uh, if you have any queries, you can unmute and you can interact with sir. Or you can also type it in the chat window. Sir, good evening, sir. Uh -huh. Myself, I am having one doubt, sir. Uh, apart from this uh, JKL citation, this uh, uh, elsewhere is giving some uh, citation journal um, index uh, per, uh, for that journal alone, it, they are giving. What is the impact on that uh, indexing, sir? Yes, I think there is Scopus index. Um, I think there are so many of them, and I'm pretty sure uh, some of them have made it a business. Uh, everybody is talking about, uh, please use our index and so on. But right now, and again, it depends on the institution, and I understand in India, UGC has uh, made this list. So you need to include it's very difficult to answer that question. Now, that's why some universities will say, please go with this particular index, you know. And I know I went to a few colleges in Coimbatore and they were talking about uh, Scopus a lot. But I think um, Web of Science is even more strict. There are much, much fewer journals compared to what Scopus is including. Because I can know that very well because my citation is much higher in Scopus compared to Web of Science. And there's a question from Sun, uh, Sen Gupta who has said uh, they already have a publication, but uh, they created the ARC ID only recently. You know, once a paper is published, it's difficult to add an ARC ID. But usually people will put that on their website. And uh, people with unique names, it's pretty good at tracking. Web of Science will track it. But you can always send an email to the Web of Science people or that company. And you can say, here are the papers I published before I got my ARC ID. 
so they can update their database. So did that answer your question, Shri, Shri Toma Sengupta? Sir, a uh, question from Issa, question from Meera. Uh, why do most journals do not publish negative results? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, we'll come back. But let me um, answer this. Another easy question I want to uh, address. Priyajit Ray uh, has asked, um, any journal where we can publish without cost or what is called as uh, article processing fee or APC as they call it. Yes, many, many journals are there that do not require you to pay money to publish. And that's another bad side of uh, this pressure to publish where so many companies are now claiming themselves as publishing scientific articles. But if you submit your paper one day, within a week, they will say your paper has been accepted, but they will ask you to pay money. And it's not just in India, it's all over the place. But my criteria will be, I will always ask the question, is that journal indexed in Web of Science? And some of them, are asking you to pay money because what they are saying is that once you pay that money, they will make it open access. So in other words, you or your institution do not have to subscribe to that particular journal. You know? So that was the reasoning behind why some reputed journals are collecting money, but others saw this as an opportunity to publish or to make money. So they have opened all these journals. So I would be a little bit careful because if you publish your work, especially good work, you have no way of knowing who is citing it and it's not going to help you build your H index or you cannot even gauge, okay, I published a paper or others reading it, you know, you won't be able to get any of that information. So I hope I answered that question. And now to the other question uh, was about negative results. Yes, uh, there's a joke. And by the way, there is a journal, you know, people always talk about that somebody needs to create one that says a journal of negative results, okay? But yes, I have seen good journals publish negative results, but the authors cannot just simply say that, yeah, we tried all this, it didn't work. That's not going to work, okay? You need to come back and explain as to why it did not work, okay? So imagine a publication is some new information or knowledge. So if we end by saying, yes, we tried all this, it didn't work, there is no new information other than the fact that, yeah, it didn't work. But when we go and explain why it didn't work and we come back with citations and detailed explanation, and I can show you some papers, especially in my field, where people wanted to map a certain type of crop fields and it didn't work. And they came back and gave such good explanation. So half of the paper explained why it didn't work. And it was published in one of the top journals in our field. So does it answer the question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. All right, uh, so the next from, uh, question. Oh, I'm just reading one from here from Joshua. It says, like, why journals are not publishing or giving much importance to replication studies? And once again, these replication studies have to have something new information. You know, that's what journals are looking for. So, if uh, going back to my uh, 
fact, hey, at Cochin University, there are a lot of uh, students, you know, in physical oceanography, chemical oceanography. They were looking at LC50 and LD50, you know, lethal concentration of heavy metals or lethal dose. And they will go back and you will see one student will complete and another student will start a little bit later. And then a few more will come and start. And I always used to wonder, why are you repeating the same study? Okay. So later we found out that they will say that, yes, when the first study was conducted, the ambient water quality in that backwater was like this. Now, five years later, the ambient water quality has changed. So the animal that they were studying is no longer living in the same environment that they used to live. It is stressed or whatever the reason might be. And they will say, now we have to repeat and determine the new LC50 or LD50. Okay, So that's the reason why they say, here is something new we need to know. Even though the study looks exactly the same, there is something new in the finding. Okay, so that's something we have to keep in mind. Okay, so yes, replication studies, and that's why I called it as reconfirming what we know. So if you do it with a new animal or you do it with a new in a new study area, all those will be considered as new contributions. So uh, I'm just reading these uh, that are showing up in the chat window. There are few open access journal with a reasonable impact factor, which are not charging for publication. Yes, I think, as I said, uh, as long as that impact factor is genuine impact factor and they are not charging you, I would say go for it, you know, but read it carefully or you may want to go back and check this uh, database to make sure because there are so many journals with similar titles with just one or two words that are different. So please uh, go back to JCR and see whether your journal is listed there. You know, And if it is there, then I think you can definitely publish. And Meera Darshini has a question about how can we be aware of predatory journals? Oh, I think um, it's really interesting because nowadays it has become a big business and these predatory journals are actually, a, it's a dangerous business now, okay? So why I say that, uh, in my neighboring state uh, called Colorado, a librarian decided to make a database of all these predatory journals. So you can go there and query exactly like how you query JCR. You can go there and query these uh, databases that he created by subject and he identified lots of predatory journals. And unfortunately, India has the most number of predatory journals, okay? And most of the people who contribute to predatory journals are also from India. So when I came to Kungunadu Arts a few years ago, there was an article published in Hindu and I shared that. So what happened to this person in Colorado is after a few years, he started receiving death threats. People were threatening to kill him if he doesn't take that website. So a little bit later, he said, like, I'm tired of, uh, I'm really scared of getting all these emails. And he just stopped his service. You know, he pulled his website down. So it is a very difficult job. And that's why I would say, rather than looking for predatory journal, please do the opposite, you know. See in your field where people are publishing their work. And then you can go to JCR and see whether it is indexed in that one. Or you can look at Scopus. Or you can look at uh, UGC list, you know, any one of those. So that way you could make sure that uh, you are not uh, submitting your work to a predatory journal. 
So uh, there is another uh, question, you know, it belong to school of design fashion. It's very difficult to students to write research papers. What would be the best way to break the ice, mm -hmm. you know? So first I have to say, I'm not uh, familiar with the research that is done, but in our university, we do have a department called family and consumer sciences where they do fashion design and they are publishing in that area, you know? So I'm going to um, type in the chat window, uh, you know, it's called University of Wyoming, you know, it's uh, family and uh, consumer sciences. And please check their website. Uh, I think they do a lot of things other than fashion design and you can um, check that one. Any other question? Uh, Dr. Amsavani, you were going to say somebody else had a question. So that's all I think, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you for... Ma'am, uh, have you addressed this uh, Shritoma Sengusta? I already have some publication and recently created an OCID ID. Can I yeah, add I... Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I answered by saying, you know, we can't add to have already published paper. But you, yeah, you can always uh, update the database. You can contact uh, JCR and you can tell them and they will add that ARC ID to those papers. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you okay. for uh, answering all the queries. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I uh, request uh, Dr. Bhuneshwari, ma'am, to share a few words. Ma'am, please. So thank you, sir, for uh, providing a very informative and wonderful presentation. In a short notice, you have uh, accepted our invitation and uh, given a wonderful presentation, sir. Thank you very much. I hope you will continue uh, your mentorship for our students and faculty members in future also. And uh, behalf of uh, Komunada Arts and Science College, they are very much delighted to honor our chief guest with an e-certificate um, as a token of love and gratitude. Uh, sir, I am presenting it now. Please accept it and uh, uh, the same will be emailed to you, sir. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ma make it uh, full screen, ma'am. It's not visible. Yes. Yes, yes ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I request Dr. V. Bhuneshwari, ma'am, Associate Professor and Head, UG Department of Biotechnology, to present the consolidated report of this four-day awareness series on intellectual property rights, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Ma'am, please. I feel proud as a convener of IAC and uh, as a convener of this program to present the Consolidated Report of Awareness Series Program on Intellectual Property Rights, Innovation and Entrepreneurship jointly organized by MHRD Institution Innovation Council, KEC IPR Cell and Department of Biotechnology held from 24-7-2020 to 27-7-2020 with the blessings of our President Dr. M. R. Chamitha and uh, by the unconditional support and motivation of our uh, dynamic secretary and director, Dr. C. A. Vasiki, ma'am. This webinar was organized to provoke research ideas and to motivate the students towards innovation and protecting uh, through uh, intellectual property and publishing in a reputable journal and to develop uh, entrepreneurial skills. Totally, there were five research persons joining this webinar and enlightened us on the above theme. The first day of this webinar was successfully started by 5 p.m. on 24th July 2020. Myself uh, welcomed the gathering 
and uh, our beloved principal dr m lakshman swami sir inaugurated the webinar series and our respected dean academics and head pg department of biotechnology dr s r madan chandra sir rendered felicitation organizing secretary of this program dr r amsaveni uh, assistant professor in biotechnology coordinated the session the first day of the session uh, webinar session on 24th july resource person was dr m s lipin day director bt eco green technology private limited kind of he enlightened with the topic part of bio entrepreneur he explained the process of starting a startup and different methods of getting funds from government of india and as well as tamil nadu the second day session was on 25th july at 5 pm which was enlightened by dr rt narendra kannan assistant professor in biochemistry Pongunad Arts and Science College with the topic Art of Writing Research Article. He explained about each and every step in writing the title and other section of a research article. And the third session was on the same day at 6 p.m. was delivered by myself, Dr. V. Bhuneshwari, on orientation to participate in National Innovation Contest 2020 organized by MHRD Innovation Cell and MHRD. inspire the students to participate in idea contest proof of concept and prototype submission and motivated the faculty members to mentor the students the fourth session was started by 5 pm on 26 july 2020 our resource person was mr j e mosh dayan faculty in triple e department and coordinator of psna ipr cell psna college of engineering technology bindical on the topic patent filing procedure in india He explained about all IPR protection and detailed each and every step involved in searching and filing the patent in India. He himself filed seven Indian patents. The first and final session was started at 5 p.m. on 27th July 2020, and the resource person was Dr. Ramesh Sivan Pillai, research scientist, SR, remote sensing scientist, University of Wyoming, USA. He shared his views on the topic. publishing innovative research in reputed journals he highlighted about the collaborating research with other department and other institution getting or cd id citation of journals and tracking search index all our research persons clarify the queries of the participants at the end of each session our dean academics and head of pg department of biotechnology as well as the convener of this webinar series dr s r madan chandra sir and myself dr v bhuneshwari convener of this webinar and head ug department of biotechnology and convener of institution innovation council involved in offering welcome address and taking all the initiatives to create this platform for this knowledge sharing session the organizing secretaries of this webinar dr r amsaveni madam and dr g anbarthi madam and the session coordinators dr p sendil kumar sir dr r ranjit kumar sir dr m gogul ramnath sir and dr b vishnu priya ma'am has taken various roles like expressing words of gratitude introducing the resource person welcoming the gathering and uh, coordinating the session each session validatory address uh, was given by um, uh, gogul dr m gogul ramnath sir and the uh, session was ended with the positive feedback from students as well as scientists and faculty members there are about 100 participants joined the live session from our institute and uh, approximately 50 to 100 participants joined each session uh, once again thank you very much uh, for the participants as well as the resource person to participate in this e um, in this program thank you very much thank you dr bhuneshwari ma'am for uh, presenting the consolidated report thank you ma'am and uh, uh, now may i request dr m gogul ramnath sir assistant professor in biotechnology to propose the word of thanks <laughs> sir please good evening all myself dr m gogul ramnath on behalf of pg and research department of biotechnology kongo dot science college it's my great privilege to deliver word of thanks in this occasion my heartfelt thanks to our president dr m aruchami sir who has been an inspiration with his dedication for the progress of our institution I sincerely thank our beloved secretary and director Dr CA Vasugi madam who has given her immense support and encouragement in all our endeavors 
I would like to thank our respected principal, Dr. M. Lakshmane Swami sir, who inaugurated this webinar series with his valuable presence. I express my gratitude to our young dynamic person, Chief Executive Officer, Dr. V. Chinu Swami sir, and Dr. Dean R. N. D. Dr. S. Paul Swami sir for their constant motivation in all our activities. I thank. Uh, kind and courteous person, Dr. S. R. Madan Shankar sir, Dean Academics and Head in the uh, PG Department of Biotechnology for his valuable guidance. I am so delighted in thanking our today's resource person, Dr. Ramesh Sivan Pillai, who spared time from his busy schedule and gave an excellent talk on publishing innovative research in reputed journals. I extend my thanks to Convener Dr. V. Bhuneshri Madam, Associate Professor and Head in UG Department of Biotechnology and Organizing Secretaries Dr. R. Amsavini Madam and Dr. G. Bhuneshri Madam, Assistant Professors in uh, Department of Biotechnology for organizing such an excellent webinar series. I also thank all our organizing members of our department for their kind and constant supports. I finally thank all the participants for their cordial cooperation and I hope you all will give the same support for all our webin upcoming webinar series. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gogul Ramnath, sir, for your words of gratitude. Thank you, sir. Uh, ma'am, uh, shall we wind up, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Dr. Ramesh Shivan Pillai, sir, you have accepted our invitation within a short notice. Thank you for presenting a nice oh, uh, webinar, sir. Oh, no, no problem. No, thank you. It's my pleasure. I've been to your college in person many yes, times. Right. Yeah, and so we have a collaboration also. Uh, we have an MOU signed with your university also. We are very much delighted. Okay. Yeah, same here. Thank you. And I have a nice evening and um, talk to you all sometime soon. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Okay.